This morning we're here to diagnose a DPF fault on this uh, Citroen Nemo van. Uh, same 1.3 Fiat engine that's in quite a few different makes of the vehicle. Um, DPFs have a pretty bad name in both the public and in the trade. They're not a terrible thing, uh, a lot of times just understanding what they're about. Unfortunately, you know, it's, it's just it's something that needs to be fitted. It's fitted for a very good reason. Um, so getting to the bottom of a fault, they don't just fault for no reason. There is always a cause. Sometimes it is driving style, uh, and we'll find out on this vehicle. We know the history of this vehicle from the customer. He's, he's recently bought it, and it's been plagued with DPF faults ever since he's purchasing it. It's done about 100,000 miles, and it used to be a multi-drop van. So that could be a good indication of, you know, it's just down to the previous driving style. Uh, but let's have a look at it and see what we find out. So here are our fault codes, um, particle filter fault uh, and total weight of soot in the filter. Now, so we don't know that it actually has a fault, we just know that, that those are the faults logged in the system. Uh, we need to look at some data. Now what I ideally like to do is to take the vehicle for a drive, uh, monitor some information, because there's always, a, like I said earlier, there's always a reason. Filters don't just block for no reason something's not working or it can again be down to the, the, the type of use the vehicle has had and this has been a multi-drop vehicle so there may be no cause other than previous driving uh, conditions but we do need to find out why you can't always do that it depends on the severity of the blockage obviously if the vehicle is very very blocked up and there's so much back pressure it's going to cause damage or it's unsafe to drive because it can't pick up speed then we won't do that but we'll uh, find out with this vehicle so uh, we have the, let's fire it up, uh, so we have our engine light as you can see, uh, up on the dash we have it saying check engine, so now if we just pop into our live data, uh, I'm using the Autel today, at most um, diagnostic equipment will happily read this, well that is already reading incredibly high just at idle. Uh, just go for that on its own and make it I like looking at things pictured it's nice and easy actually let's look at it like it's a gauge so it's very high right I'm gonna turn it off and just have ignition on so what's the sensor reading with ignition on two millibar one millibar zero millibar so you know it could just be a faulty sensor let's see what we do so one millibar key off ignition on fired up 150 to 160 millibar that's a we're in the region of 2 psi, um, 1.5 to 2 psi, I'm not sure, offhand. It's already incredibly high, I would like to see around 20-25 millibar at idle. Uh, let's give her a rev. Over 600. And I can hear like a sort of noise. I think that's a build up of pressure. I don't think this vehicle is going to be safe to drive. Unfortunately, in this instance, I think we're going to have to repair the DPF uh, fault before figuring out what caused it, just to make the vehicle safe to get out on the road and record some information. I mean, I could look at airflow and stuff now um, to figure out, you know, possible EGR faults, uh, fuel pressures, check fuel. But the fact that the DPF is so blocked, it could be interfering in the system. I could be bucking up the wrong tree, and it could be a faulty sensor. So I think our next step is going to be manually test the pressure. So let's do that now. Okay, so we've disconnected the pressure sensor before the DPF here. Rigged up a manual pressure tester. So we'll lay this out on the screen somewhere we can see it. Like that, here we go. Right, let's fire it up. Uh, there we go, idle, 2 PSI. So our sensor is correct, it's incredibly high. And okay, so my gauge stops at 10 PSI, this goes to the needle stop. We have a very blocked DPF, right, what we're gonna have to do on this one is attempt to clean, see what happens if that's acceptable then we can carry on testing so it's a couple of hours later uh, I've lost a few hours due to a diagnostic interface issue should we call it I've tried several computers and several methods of uh, 
getting this vehicle to start to passively or even forcibly regenerate, and it couldn't. Um, this is a Fiat based vehicle, and unfortunately, sometimes uh, aftermarket tools, obviously, it's a Citroën going trying to work it as a Citroën, didn't like it. Uh, there's a bit of a mismatch in communication type stuff. So to get this to regenerate itself, you need to get rid of the permanent fault with the DPF. So once the work is done, uh, rather than forcibly regenerate something, I like to tell it it's new, so it'll allow it to behave normally for a while and then go and road test it and let it uh, actively or passively regenerate itself. However, uh, part of this system is when you tell it it's new, it wants to do a regeneration anyway to learn itself, learn its own parameters, which is fine. Nothing would work. I've tried several computers, several different computers. Anyway, I cracked it in the end, but um, it wasn't rocket science. But now we're out on the road, right? we've got no warning light. Cruising at 2,000 RPM, around about 50 miles per hour. We are just cooling down from regeneration temperature at 103 millibar. What's it like under load? 240 millibar maximum. Uh, I'm going to drive for a little bit more and then start checking the airflow and fuel pressures. But I certainly think that this is down to it being a multi drop vehicle. So I've been out and checked it, and uh, everything's pretty good. So it does look like it's just the history of the vehicle that was the cause of the fault. But what I mean by checking sort of the fuel side and the air side and things like that is what you want to do is, and you do this under load, you know, you can record with most diagnostic equipment and then go through it afterwards, is you want to monitor what the fuel pressure is doing as you're loading the vehicle up. Uh, what you need for that is reference pressure. Now, on this, you know, on a lot of vehicles, you have what it's expecting to see versus what you are seeing. That's very handy, what you're expecting to see. If you don't have that, you need to find that information. Um, and went out and road test this and it was all tickety boo uh, and then also to so things like the inlet circuit um, you can monitor this in multiple ways and, and multiple different um, components can be monitored and air at different places I like to um, monitor inlet manifold pressure um, which is at that This does measure nicely. I know you're seeing here uh, we've got 871 millibar versus um, a thousand. Um, but as soon as we there you go, just holding it there, it is correct. Um, not too worried about that idle. Uh, and out on the road, it is nice. But again, we've got a reference pressure, a reference value, and a measured. Uh, if you don't know that, you need to find what is meant to be. That's about it, really. Um, but I'm quite happy this one's all done, finally, after... What time to get here? Nine o'clock, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> it should have taken half that time, really. Less than half that. But there we go. It's the fun and games of fixing vehicles. Now I'm off home in my lovely vehicle. Oh, no. In fact, I'm not. I'm off to do some keys. Right, thanks a lot for watching. Bye.